people were so confident that inflation was trans. A good idea. Unfortunately, today, there's a few things we know for sure. This inflation is hurting all Americans, and it's hurting the poor particularly hard. That we know for sure. Second, the longer it lasts, the more it's going to create demand destruction, meaning that the average American not only get hit by higher prices, but they will start worrying about their income. And that is not a situation that we really want to be in. If, if that's what's facing the, the American consumer or the American public, what's your sense? The Economist had a piece about how CEOs did not come up in an age of hyperinflation, that this is the first time for businesses to deal with, a, with an inflationary moment. How does that change the toolkit that businesses have to use to face the economic conditions today? Well, they've got to be both more resilient and more agile, more resilient and be able to absorb the higher costs and more agile in knowing how much of this they can pass on. It is also difficult for households. We haven't had to deal with this amount of inflation. So it's putting everybody out of their comfort zone. And that's an additional worry that we may not know how to react quickly enough and we may create a problem, create a deeper problem. That's why policy leadership is so critical at this stage. So I'm going to ask you to do, give the, the darkest picture as you see it, and then perhaps the most optimistic. Let's, let's start with the, with the darkest in terms of how long economic difficulties might be with us uh, and what they might look like if, if things continue to go in a darker direction. So we're now in a period of stagflation, meaning lower growth and higher inflation. The darkest period is that inflation persists, heads to 9%. People start worrying that it's going to go to 10%. And next thing you know, we end up in a recession. And that would be tragic if that were to happen. Um, because again, it is the most vulnerable segments of the population that get hit hard. What's the best is that the Fed regains control of the inflation narrative, and we have what's called a soft landing. Inflation comes down without us sacrificing growth too much. Unfortunately, the balance of risks is tilted in a negative way right now. Let me ask you about stagflation, a word we hear a lot. Feel free to define it a little bit more, and let me ask you this question. I thought that stagflation included also a piece of high unemployment. We don't have high unemployment, so why isn't that a possibly bright sign? Oh, that's a really good sign. Um, we have a strong labor market, and that's what's keeping us away from a recession right now. <laughs> that's why a recession is a risk scenario, not a baseline. The one bad thing about our labor market is that we don't have enough labor force participation. We don't have enough workers. We have twice as many jobs that are open that there are workers. And what we need is more workers entering the labor force. That would help tremendously with our economic outlook. In terms of options, we've talked about the Fed. What other policymakers or areas of, of uh, help might come to, to fix the economic situation that America faces? So number one is, as we talked about, the Fed regaining control of inflation. Number two is focusing more fiscal support on the most vulnerable segment of the population. Number three are what we call <clears throat> restructuring measures, increasing productivity and labor force participation. And finally, Let's not forget about financial markets. The last thing we want is financial instability to undermine economic prosperity. So we need more focus on financial stability. Can I ask you just about the labor force participation piece? What does that mean exactly? So for example, better childcare would encourage more women to come back into the labor force. Retraining and retooling would allow more people to re-enter the labor force. We have the people, they are just out of the labor market, either by choice or by necessity, and anything we can do to re-engage them is a win-win. All right, Mohamed al -Aryan, thank you so much for being with us. We're going to be talking to you again. I'm, uh, I'm certain of that. Thanks again. Thanks. And we'll be right back. Nurses. You <clears throat> what the experts didn't put into the equation is that they're basing their facts and, and their uh, analogies off of old data. And now we're dealing with a global society that 
you're going to see cries and demands that will go up on hundreds of cities across the country yesterday demanding tougher gun laws on levels like we've never seen before and and they give guide and the bottom line is this is that whenever you have a group of people that thought that they was invincible not just necessarily with the Americans but with the powerful and the rich that done what they done 30 plus years ago now this is all caught up with them to the degree that these are major major con conflicting is uh, issues contradicting conflicting issues that is now affecting the world all over and if you'll compile that with COVID, if you'll compile that with what went on in Ukraine, if you'll compile that with the grain that has now suddenly been snatched from the world global market, if you'll compile that with other factors in regards towards natural catastrophes of either too much rain or not enough rain or hurricanes or whatever, if you'll compile all these things together, guess what you have? You have a formula of a perfect storm. You have a formula of basically the Rubicon. And once we cross over the Rubicon, we are at the point of no return at that point. And that's what the professionals and that's what the politicians and the experts aren't telling you that we have already done went over the threshold of the Rubicon. That is correct. Florida four years ago. The message to lawmakers was direct. Act now or get voted out. If our government can't do anything to stop 19 kids from being killed and slaughtered in their own school and decapitated, it's time to change who is in it. In perhaps a sign of the times, there was some brief panic at the rally here in Washington yesterday when a man yelled and threw an object into the crowd, sending people running from the stage. This morning we've learned that a bipartisan group of senators have reached an agreement on new measures to address gun violence, with an announcement expected late. See, and that's the very thing that I got charged with in 2005 up here in Martin, Tennessee, in Weekly County pretending to falsify files, pretending to what that guy obviously has said or done towards throwing something into the audience and creating a panic. That's exactly what that individual just done, which according to the Tennessee law books has implication, terrorist implications towards wanting to bring harm and hurt into people's lives. That's what that individual just done at that at that rally. Trees of perpetrators of mass shootings about five years ago. And our goal was to try to understand where is this coming from? Why are we seeing this increase? And who are these perpetrators? So we built a database that includes 180 perpetrators who killed four or more people in a public space going back about 50 years. And we coded each of them on over 200 pieces of life history information to try to look for patterns in the data. And we also conducted interviews with perpetrators themselves, people who knew them, victims and experts in the field to really try to add some data and analysis to understand where this is coming from and what we can do to stop it. So Dr. Densley, what composite were you able to come with, to come up with, or were you based on all of these data uh, in terms of what the typical mass shooter is like? Yeah, I think a lot of people are searching for a profile of a mass shooter and we instead saw a pathway to a mass shooting and we, we outline that pathway in our, in our book called The Violence Project. So it starts with early childhood trauma. Many of these mass shooters have experienced some pretty horrific things in life, early in life. And this is unsettled, unresolved trauma that I think comes back later in life and is part of what we describe as being a crisis point in these people's lives. Mass shooters are in crisis. These are individuals who are not living their best selves. They are questioning their place in the world. It's often- What that individual just got to is telling you was absolutely false because it's leaning towards the psychiatric community side 
that if you've ever had anything horrible happen to you in the past in your childhood that that basically gives you a right to get out here and do whatever that you want to do in society and if you do that there'll be somebody like him that will stand up for you in initiating a sentence a plea bargain towards in an insanity plea oh you can't you can't give this individual the capital punishment because he or she uh, got talked to bad whenever they was a child growing up this is the very thing that has got us in the trouble to begin with and I continue to keep telling that to people again and again and again and obviously it keeps being ignored and that's really the key here so Jillian Peterson one of the things you've written is that uh to change the mindset about the way we think about um, these shooters, that they are us. So how does that, that help in these moments of crisis? Where, for example, would you seek a policy intervention uh, if you change that mindset, if that's the first step? Yeah, I think we tend to think of the perpetrators who do this as just these evil monsters kind of lurking out there. And of course, what they do is monstrous. But before they do it, they are our classmates, our nieces or nephews, our neighbors, their children going to the school. These tend to be insiders, not outsiders. So the most likely perpetrator of a school shooting is in the classroom. And when we recognize that, I think it kind of shifts our mindset to make us start noticing some of these signs of a crisis, to notice when people are leaking their plans or talking about this kind of violence or talking about suicide. And so our research really points to things like suicide prevention and crisis intervention training, building crisis response teams in schools and workplaces, and having some of those systems in place to catch people before they do this. So Dr. Densley, then it's about- Once more, talking about suicide prevention. You have a group of people out there that are wicked and demonic, they're powerful, most of them has a little bit of money. Most of them has some clout. Okay. My brother and I, one of the first things that we've done, we share an interest in the Windmill Ministries missions towards putting out various cards around, around in the area pertaining to suicide prevention in regards to our veterans. My brother knew that the system had turned upon to him. Not just his peers here in this area, but the system had turned upon to him to the point that we was basically left here to be thrown to the wolves. And the proof is in the pudding towards what Tommy Moore, Judge Tommy Moore, um, Tommy Thomas, and, and the judicial system in this area done whenever my brother actually did die of the very things that I'm talking to you about. And then, Society attacked me because they already had him out of the picture. They attacked me towards trying to uh, uh, blame his, my brother's death on myself. And once they wasn't going to be able to accomplish that, then they attacked me through a neighbor across the road that my brother and I was concerned about three kids that actually drove me to the point of suicide. Now, the people that drove me to the point of suicide in this area and up there in the courthouse and over there in the sheriff's office has yet to be held accountable. And they will be held accountable beginning in Kenton, Tennessee. And these are the things that I continue to keep preaching and teaching. These people think that they're slick and sly. They think that they can do the magician's hand, the slick, the, the sly of the hand, and ain't nobody going to notice what they're involved in or what they're doing. They're actually driving people to the point of walking off in, into the abyss as far as committing suicide. The rich, the powerful, the demonic, the corrupt. Why would an individual that felt so strongly, passionately about our soldiers and basically anybody in general in committing suicide put out all these leaflets to society and then three years later tried to do the very act that he himself was against? I'm going to tell you why. It's because I was driven to it. I was driven to it after my world crumbled right before me, after I realized that I'd made a mistake by renting out a, 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 my home to an individual that was nothing more than a drug user and a drug abuser and probably a drug seller that I was talked into because I was in a very vulnerable position towards grieving of my brother's death. 
even after the PA in the sheriff's office addressed me about the problem and the only thing I could say was well yeah I agreed to that towards letting that individual stay there but I didn't realize it was it was going to com compound into about 10 or 12 they actually come in here and rip me and my brother absolutely blind they got any and everything that they considered at that time to be valuable it didn't matter what it was electronics guns whatever they stole everything that we could imagine and on top of that, they was already pre-planning towards what that they was going to steal, of things that they was going to set back. And I guess eventually, if I didn't go ahead and plea bargain to a charge that I never should have plea bargained to, as far as me stalking a family in concern towards not knowing what was going to happen to the children across the road, I guess these heathens around here would have basically... Uh, hooked onto my trailer and, and, and got my dad's uh, tandem axle trailer and his single axle trailer and, and, and any and everything that was considered salvageable and then it took off with it. To this day, these people are still at large. That drove my brother to an early death and drove me off into a state of suicide. To this day, they're still walking around sniggering and laughing and thinking, oh wow, we almost had him, didn't we? We almost got him. These evil demonic monsters are the very people that's creating the problem instead of having a solution to the problem. And that's the reason why I go to all these preachers that I put this message out to very, very, very promptly beginning in the late 80s, going to church to church. I think there was 130 churches here in Weekly County. I don't know. I think there was 90 churches in Gibson County I went to. I think there was about maybe 45 churches in Lake County, about another 100 and something churches in O'Brien County, and then I'd hit Dyer County, and then I'd hit Gibson uh, Gibson County, and I mean uh, Madison County, and, and then I'd hit uh, uh, Carroll County, and basically went from county to county to county to county to county again and again and again over the period of years not days not weeks not months but years in issuing out this message and because society was so dead set that they wasn't going to have it that they was basically blaming me for cramming it down their throats well, you know what I've said before and I'll say again? It couldn't have happened to a better group of people towards what's happening right now, towards the ground that they was walking on has now shifted. Now, does that mean I want hardship and hard heartache to fall upon to, to uh, innocent men, women, and children's lives? No, 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 not at all. Not at all. But what it does mean is that I want the people that is guilty that has caused this in the past 30 some odd years I want them to be held accountable beginning with the with the Reagan whoever people that are, are still alive pertaining to the media at the time that was in charge with the Reagan administration Walter Cronkite whoever uh, beginning with the Bushes uh, uh, Bush senior and then and then uh, Bush junior I want these people to be held accountable because it was these people that was stuffing their pockets full it was these people that was taking advantage of the system. It was these people that was saying one thing, but doing just the very opposite. And whenever I'm talking about these people, I'm just not talking about politicians. I'm talking about church members. I'm talking about preachers. I'm talking about deacons. I'm talking about various people that claim that they had a walk with God. But nobody was willing to lay down their lives the same as Christ was willing to lay down his. It is absolutely appalling in what Northwest Tennessee has done, and they're still trying to cover it up to this day by being in denial about it. It is absolutely appalling, just like what went on in Memphis, Tennessee with Martin Luther King. It is absolutely appalling what they did, what that they done down towards uh, Crump Tennessee, Savannah, Tennessee, in regards to an individual that they had hired to take care of their problems. And then once he started cleaning up their county, then various corrupt people come to him and said, you know what? You know what, Mr. Buford Pulser, walking tall, 
we only wanted you to clean up part of the problem and not the whole problem because you're, now you're stepping on our finances. You're stepping on our profitability. And that's whenever he said, you know what, you hired me to clean up the county. And that's what I'm going to do. And that's whenever various people in that county turned against him. The powerful, the rich, the corrupted of the corrupted. Those that go to church every Sunday and usually sit on the, on the front or second pew with a white shirt and a tie. Those are the people that has put us in the positions that we are at right now. And I continue to keep saying that again and again and again. Who is the monsters? The ones that was, that was uh, uh, leading... In trapping the Davidians, in buying all them assault rifles, coming over the Fast and Furious, so over the Rio Grande, down by Mexico, are those that was actually planning on using them. And of course, whenever they realized that the very people that had sold them them guns was the very people that was going to come back and bust them and arrest them for buying those guns, that's whenever all hell broke out down there at Mount Karma pertaining to the Waco incident. We are dealing with a society right now that is so demonic and so so wicked that they think that they can outsmart, outmaneuver, outpower. They think that all this is just going to suddenly go away. And I got news for you. It's not going away. If it does anything, it's only going to intensify and get worse. It's always been a vital source of information for American families. So what is the state of local news today? 60 Minutes investigates tonight on CBS. Social media platform. That's what it is. Donald Trump realized that whenever he was running for president and he used social media platform. And that was one of the reasons why Donald Trump fight and a shooting. Anywhere, done what anytime. he done pertaining to being elected the first time on the presidency is because he used social media platforms. He got his message out there. He got his message out there to a group of people that ordinarily never listens to prime time. They never listen to 60 Minutes. They never listen to Face the Nation. They never listen to all these other influential news broad broadcasting stations. Is because they know what happened in 1988 and with Walter Cronkite and the rest of those news reporting industries at that time. They knew that how that the politicians had bamboozled not only the founder of the windmill ministries but the people in general and because of it the people has lost credibility in their news agencies as well as their preachers as well as their politicians. That's where we are right now folks. But yet now I still have a society around here that either wants to ignore me or they still are, are pleading their case by saying they're right and I'm wrong. Well, I'm pleading my case by saying I'm right and they're wrong. And as this thing is falling apart, you're going to see who's really right and who's really wrong. Because I guarantee you the smart, the professionals, the experts, the, 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 the uh, uh, wealthy uh, are not going to pull this off again towards... towards uh, Padding this down to to let's say a a, a a cushion landing or a padded landing towards thinking that all oh, this is suddenly just going to up and go away because I got news for you it ain't going away we have lost our industrial complex industry here in America pertaining to us being the number one the number one industry of the world and we have almost lost the the uh, status towards being the number one powerful smartest most dependable military in the world and whenever we lose the power of the almighty dollar then we'll basically be left naked just like what it talks about in the first three chapters of revelations for I will show thee who actually rules the reins of the hearts of man, those that are rich and those that thought that they had abundantly of this and abundantly of that, that he will basically not only throw us off into a sickbed, but throw us off into tribulation. That's where we're heading. We're heading to great tribulation. I don't know how great that this tribulation is going to be, 
Uh, it will continue to drastically get worse and worse and worse and worse so, for some countries, more so than it will in others. But it will continue to get worse and worse and worse until it just gets so bad that it's just horrifying. And that's whenever God will step in and put an end to all of it. Got it. And, and I really think that that's where a lot of people here in America well, want Alex, it to go. We have they really want it to go in that direction. Big, big development out of the Senate with senators saying that there's now going to be a, a, an agreement on a framework with, with Democrats and Republicans, the way to move forward on this legislation. Now, of course, we don't have an actual text of the legislation, but I want to read to you a little bit about what's in the bill. There's enhanced background checks for 18 and 21 year olds. There's a provision for closing the boyfriend loophole which deals with domestic violence there's also some money in there for mental health and also for trafficking of guns i also want to of course read to you a statement from the white house because the president himself is now saying that he is liking what he's seeing that he's endorsing this i want to read to you here's part of it um the president says quote i want to thank senator chris murphy and the members of his bipartisan group especially senators cornyn cinema and tillis for their tireless work to produce this proposal obviously he says it does not do everything that i think is needed but it reflects important steps in the right direction and would be the most significant gun safety legislation to pass Congress in decades. He goes on to say, with bipartisan support, there are no excuses for delay and no reason why it should not quickly move to the Senate and the House. Each day that passes, more children are killed in this country. The sooner it comes to my desk, the sooner I can sign it, and the sooner we can use these measures to save lives. So that is President Biden saying that he is in some ways really understanding that while he is not getting everything that he wants, that this is really a step in the right direction. And I should also remind viewers, there isn't any talk right now of banning assault weapons. That is something that President Biden has said that he wanted to see happen, but he also made an important caveat, and that caveat being that if the Congress cannot ban assault weapons, then they should still be able to do something. And this Sunday morning, we are seeing that something, the president, of course, as well as people who have been impacted by gun violence, they've been urging lawmakers to, to really turn pain into action. And now we see a big, big development that really shows that lawmakers are feeling the urgency of the moment. I should also say I've been talking to some sources and there are already gun legislation advocates, people who want to see guns restricted, um, voicing their support as well, including David Hogg, who of course is a survivor of the Parkland shooting. He says that this, while this is again not everything that he wants, that this is really a blueprint for lawmakers to move forward. We've also heard from some lawmakers um, about the timeline of this, saying that they want to move quickly Though I have not been told exactly when that would be, but you already hear President Biden saying, please get this, get this to my desk as soon as possible. Look, I think the reality of the challenge of getting gun reform legislation through Congress is quite apparent to anybody who lives in this country and who is frustrated by the multiple, multiple delays. Uh, so the fact is you have to look at it very practically, pragmatically, say, this is what we're going to get right now. We can get this, lock it in and then move forward again as as we need to. So that's what we hope the Senate will do. But the question is, Ali Rafa, as you are there on Capitol Hill, will this deal get enough support to pass? I mean, it needs at least 10 Republican senators. So what are you hearing on that? Yeah, Alex, this, this is huge news, but apparently there is also a huge group of senators that is backing it. According to a press release that Senator Chris Murphy sent out, he's the senator that's been leading this effort for nearly 10 years now since the Sandy Hook shooting. 10 Republicans and 10 Democrats have signed on to this agreement that he says, quote, saves lives while also protecting the constitutional rights of law-abiding Americans. He says we look forward to earning broad bipartisan support and passion passing our common sense proposal into law. As you mentioned, Democrats needed at least 10 Republicans to sign on to this, to vote with Democrats, uh, to be able to break that filibuster and get any sort of action done. We're hearing that these uh, 10 senators are, of course, Texas Senator uh, John Cornyn, the Republican who has been working with Murphy so hard on, on getting some sort of reform done. He was given a sort of a blessing by Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell to, to get these negotiations going. And this proposal, as Yamish really laid out, is more ambitious than we expected. She went through the bullets there of what to expect. The real question now is how quickly these proposals can be drafted into anything that can be voted on. Because before these senators left this weekend, there was this unofficial deadline of Friday to get a, a sort of a preliminary framework of, of a draft done before they left this weekend. They obviously missed that deadline, but again, today, Sunday, 
they're coming uh, to a conclusion. The question now is, will we see a vote on this? They had sort of hinted uh, to the 4th of July as a, as a sort of unofficial deadline to get this done. Uh, but this is ob obviously coming uh, the day after. I would not be wanting to go to any major public event coming this 4th of July weekend. I don't care if it was inside a gymnasium, if it was outside a school, if it was in a park, or if it was at wherever, I would not be wanting to participate in any major population event because of the locos. And whenever I say loco, I actually mean evil mean, cruel, demonic, insensitive people out there that are wanting to commit these acts of violence because they feel like that the world has let them down. They feel like that, and in a sense, they're absolutely correct. The world has let them down, okay? Because it has went all towards the powerful and the rich and the elite. Well, now... It's catching up with them to the point that they cannot control law and order here in our streets any longer towards protecting us from harm, either physical harm, financial harm, or emotional harm. They cannot protect us pertaining to other people coming in and hacking into our accounts. They cannot protect us pertaining to our children going to sacred areas like schools or churches. And they have failed in their attempts of the whole primary purpose of us hiring, hiring them and putting them in these positions to begin with. Whenever it reaches the state that it's, that it's heading towards right now, if we don't turn it around, that's whenever it gives a right to the American people of standing up and not only causing an insurrection, but actually causing a coup of taking over the government because the government has failed we the people. That is in our Constitution. That there will come a pivoting point. The only problem that I can see with that, that at first, if that was to occur, and I've said this before in some of my other materials, I believe that the military would have to be forced under their oath to abide by their superiority here in the United States, regardless whether it was a three, four, five-star general, regardless whether it was the President of the United States. In other words, they would have to take their commands from upper upper levels on top that would cause a bad, bad friction with the people that were standing up for their independence to be liberated. And I believe that in the process of the bloodbath, and that's exactly what I'm talking about here, that eventually the military would realize that these politicians have stonewalled all of us, that these politicians has lied to all of us, that these politicians has failed all of us, and because of it, they would eventually side to the people more so than siding with the politicians. But it would take a bloodbath to get that to, to ever pull that off. It would take a literal war, a civil war, to be able to ever pull that off. And that's basically what it's going to take with, with the people in China, the, the, the citizens in China. That's basically what it's going to take with the citizens in Russia. That's basically what it's going to take with the citizens of any of these corrupt organizations, even those that claim to be a democracy, but in truth they are in fact something else like a hypocrisy in, in the form of taking care of the rich taking care of the rich. The powerful taking care of the powerful. Well, what did Jesus say? What did Christ say about this? Jesus basically said that birds of a feather flock together. That sinners love other sinners. Sinners give gift to sinners. Sinners do favor for other sinners. In other words, the crooked 
takes care of the crooked. The corrupt takes care of the corrupt. What What is our saying over here in America? That, that birds of a feather flock together? In other words, if you have a big bank account, I'm pretty sure that you'll probably be able to manage your way towards being able to speak to the governor of the state of Tennessee or any other governor in any other state. But if you're somebody like me, just a peon, somebody that they've already done tried to step on, somebody that they brought all kinds of false, fake accusations towards, somebody that was trying to help society rather than hurt society, they're just going to push people like me off uh, hoping that I'll go away because they basically see me as like a fly that continues to keep flying around your head, okay? And you keep swatting at it, but you can't really hit it. Every now and then you may think that you got it down, but then again, here come that day gum, same day gum fly. It comes a nuisance. They see people like me being a nuisance. Now they'll tell you that they care about their citizens. They'll tell you that they care about their their uh, uh, their community or or their particular uh, branch that they're involved in with government. They'll tell you these things because naturally, if they didn't. By and large, hopefully the the uh, people that's voting would vote them out. So that's where they bamboos bamboozled the people. They have bamboozled the people in thinking that hey, they're going to put me in power to be able to because I promised them that I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna take care of those potholes in front of their in front of their uh, in front of their homes on, on this particular road. But then whenever the same person that you believed that was going to take care of those potholes gets elected. Guess what happens to the potholes? You got it. They stay the same. And if anything, the potholes grows in magnitude and actually becomes worse. So who's the monsters here? Is it the monsters that actually pick up the guns pertaining to the Davidians that use them against ATF that that actually sold ATF that sold them those guns? towards trying to make a case because of some sort of tax violation? Who's the monsters here? Was it really the Davidians that was fighting for their lives, fighting for their dignity, fighting for their freedom? The doomsday preppers that was already preparing for something like that, and then it happened? Who's the monsters here? Now, granted, I'm a peaceful man, and I believe in taking things and trying to do things in a very peaceful way because the Bible says to be wise as serpents but harmless as doves. But whenever it comes to push push and shove towards what that a lot of these law enforcement agencies are trying to, to uh, get over on various people just like George Floyd, and I could mention uh, probably a, a two or three dozen other cases where law enforcement has just went in and just basically brutalized their citizens in some sort of way. Um, you know, run them down, shot them in the back of the head, whatever. <clears throat> shot them whenever there was no reason to shoot them, basically because they didn't like that person. They was very a biased uh, approach on that person. But then again, I can see other cases where law enforcement allows for certain people to get away with almost murder. Murder. So you might, might be asking yourself, where? How come this is happening this way? Well, the Bible says that Satan will come down in great wrath because he knoweth his time is short. Satan works within these powerful, powerful people, these very, very powerful people that are in these powerful positions. Maybe not all of them, but probably a great deal of them. And they are purposely misleading the general public because their bottom line is this. They're going to save their own skins before they worry about saving somebody else's. That's the reason why whenever they get into power, they become filthy, stinking rich, just like Dick Cheney over over the deal of, of uh, the hurricane, Hurricane Katrina. They got filthy, stinking rich, went into power at $3 million, being the vice president to Bush, and come out being worth about $70 million. I don't know what he's worth now because he's generated Halliburton and oil producing companies and, and all these other different things, but it was really, really obvious towards what that they was doing back during the time that they was doing it because Bush would give an order to the military to blow up a certain area of 
of uh, of the area that they was blowing up, and then here would come Halliburton that would come in behind them towards building building the bridge back or building whatever back, and and the and the American people was not only paying our president and our military to blow it up, but we was paying Halliburton, Dick Cheney, to go back and rebuild it again. That's what really went on. If people really want to investigate where this started towards putting us in the positions that we're in right now, it started 30 some odd years ago. It's really sad. I worked Katrina for almost a year. I've worked other natural catastrophes, regardless of whether it's ice storms, tornadoes, whatever. And I've only seen these natural catastrophes continue to get worse. Now you, now you may be asking, why are they getting worse? Well, whenever you continue to keep biting the hand that feeds you, pertaining to the Creator, the Heavenly Father, eventually He'll take His protected hand off of that group of people and He'll quit feeding you. He'll quit protecting you because you have violated the principles. Whenever you violate those principles, he no longer has to stick closer to you than a brother. He no longer has to fulfill his obligations, for I will stick with you even until the ends of the world. Why? Because you have backslidden. Now some Baptists would tell you, you can't backslide, that once you ever become a true born-again saved person, that you cannot be backslidden to the degree based upon the scripture that says that no man can pluck you from the Father's hand, spiritually speaking. If they have truly been saved and born again, I agree with that. But if they have truly been saved and born again, they're not going to be acting in a very hostile, corrupt, demonic way like a lot of them are. That's the catching point towards separating the girls from the ladies or the men from the boys is that there's so many people out there that said that they had a relationship with God but in reality never did or if they did they they faltered from it because of the lifestyle that they was living and because they're no longer trying to live a righteous lifestyle in the eyes of the holy righteous God the God of the living God's basically turned his back on them. And he can do that individually. He can do that as a community. He can do that as a, as a county, a state, a country, or a planet. And that's basically what we're seeing right now. And until we wisen up to this in understanding what's going on, that Satan is coming down in great wrath, including the storms, including the natural catastrophes that God is aligned for, for, for what mankind down here has created, and not paying attention to the signs, they're only going to intensify and, yes, even get worse. The day after tens of thousands marched in uh, D.C. and several other places across the country for the March for Their Lives, senators had said for weeks that this time felt different, that they really felt that they could get some sort of action finally done. Senate Maj uh, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has been waiting for them to get some sort of proposal drafted to be able to put that on the floor. Take a listen to what Congresswoman Madeline Dean had to say about the timeliness of this moment. These past few weeks, I've been talking to anybody and everybody about measures to move forward. Stop just thoughts and prayers. Actions are what matter. And to a person, whether it was a victim sitting in our nine-hour hearing in judiciary uh, or an advocate who's been working on this for 25 years, uh, to other lawmakers, every one of us said this time feels different. And I see that it will be different. Republicans in this group of negotiators had said that they believed they could get more uh, to jump on board in support of this. So that's something we're going to be looking for in the next few days. What other Republicans, besides the 10 that have signed on to uh, these proposals, what other Republicans sign on to this? And also whether McConnell gets his blessing. We've seen a statement since this announcement of this deal from McConnell. He says in part, quote, I am glad Senators Cornyn and Murphy are continuing to make headway in their discussions. I appreciate their hard work on this important issue. 
issue. I continue to hope their discussions yield a bipartisan product that makes significant headway. But of course, Alex, that really falls short of a pledge of support for any sort of legislation that could be put uh, to the floor for a vote. You know, it's funny to me because of the big influence insurance companies. It's really funny to me that whenever they started basing their statistics off of safety, nobody, nobody contradicted them pertaining to putting seat belts in automobiles that I know of. Whenever they started designing third brake lights to go in the back of window hatches, whenever they designed airbags, ABS, anti-lock brake systems, whenever they started uh, putting in other other type safety features towards the collapse of the steering wheel column, being sure that the fuselage itself was made out of certain titanium metals, that way if the vehicle ever did roll over, that that titanium metal would not collapse. Uh, it was basically like a roll cage, like, like they have in a race car, to the point that that vehicle should be able to roll over uh, several different times before the top actually collapses. It's kind of like an RV. I think they have a basic baseline on any RV. Um, I don't know about the older ones, that they're supposed to be able to hold 500 pounds, a 500 pound person, on any part of the roof pertaining to an RV. Now. Granted, whenever I get up here and walk around as heavy as I am, <clears throat> I would like to put another piece of plywood below my feet. That way I know that I know that I'm not going to wind up falling through the roof. Because it is kind of flimsy up there whenever you walk around being as heavy as I am. But the point that I'm trying to make is safety, safety, safety. Nobody argues with safety. Or they haven't been that I'm aware of. I've been familiarized with the car industry now all my life. And I really got involved in it professionally since the, I guess, mid-80s. Somewhere around the mid-80s. Uh, started doing auto body work towards taking cars apart and putting them back together again. And fixing uh, the problems that people create towards having horrible, horrible accidents. And I, I don't remember a case where anybody was red flagging a insurance company or, or some sort of a engineer who said suddenly all of a sudden we've got this idea that if, if we do this we can save this amount of lives. You know why people don't argue about that? Because it's common sense strategy. Just like it should be common sense strategies on reaching the limitations of gun reform. We are no longer dealing with a single barrel, single shot, black powder gun. We are dealing with military style assault rifles out there on the streets that never should have been permitted out on the streets to begin with because now you're having these same people just like the Davidians over in Waco, Texas, the standoff in 1993 that helped to manufacture towards what went on in 1995 in the Oklahoma incident. You got these people now that they're dead set. They're going to fight to the very end because they're doomsday preppers. They, they are getting ready for the inedible. And who let this happen? Who let this happen? Various government officials that has been in power are no longer are in power but was in power that still to this day think that they got off scot-free. Just like this bunch around here. They think that they got off scot-free because had nobody approached them in a legal way. Or had nobody sued Tommy Moore or Tommy Thomas or their uh, uh, judicial system up here in Dresden, Tennessee or Kenton, Tennessee over here in uh, in City Hall, or Randy Brundridge pertaining to what went on uh, with 
Central Baptist Church in my particular life pertaining to what uh, that individual done. Nobody has approached them from a legal perspective pertaining to their own guidelines here up here in the United States. And because of it, they think, well, I got away with that one. Kind of like the people in Oklahoma. Well, we sure screwed that individual over, didn't we? Planted a bomb in the back end of his truck and then turned around and convinced people that it was him that was the bad guy and that all we was trying to do was protect the public. No, all they was trying to do was character assassination towards trying to promote me as me being the bad guy because I had gotten too close to the investigation in understanding that there had to be more with the explosion that killed a hundred and something people that day that they blamed it all on Timothy McVeigh and Nichols in a rider truck and 3,000 pounds of ammonium nitrate. That's what actually happened. The deal with Kentucky up here I had gotten too close to some major issues pertaining to land between the lakes and because they become paranoid because my dad put me on the radar one thing led to another and another thing led to another and the next thing you know they're trying to make me out to be a monster a bad guy but on the other hand what initiated what was initiated in 2005 in Martin Tennessee towards a group of people that thought that they could pull it pull the wool over the people's eyes here in Weekly County in convincing the Weekly Countyans that they had once more become a superhero in saving society because they had arrested this individual by charging him with falsifying files even though he was not in a public area even though he was not in a school even though he was not in a theater he did not pull down a fire alarm he did not cry fire 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 and create a panic but yet now, according to their newspaper agencies up here that posted it, the Martin PD and the Weekly County Courts was considered heroes because they had accomplished by getting Dennis Jackson and his attorney to a, to a plea out on a guilty plea of falsifying files even though none of the above happened. The only thing that I said to an individual that there was so much controversy in my life that I was liable to wind up on Channel 6 News. They asked me extensively in Martin PD before they bulldozed the building down and put a library there towards thinking that they was going to be able to cover up all their mistakes, okay, with their Yankee Doodle Dandy law enforcement agencies that's been in power now for the past 35, 40 years here in Weekly County towards basically railroading whoever that they wanted to railroad, back alley courts, back alley judges. They asked me extensively, what did you mean by that? And I said, there, I did not mean anything harmful, anything hurtful. I did not tell that individual anything harmful or hurtful. But yet, no, they still pursued it. After them going to Carroll County and arresting me illegally without a formal warrant and without being assisted by Carroll County police officer. So it just goes on and on and on and like I said they continue to want to dish it out but they're not willing to take it. Beginning with Kenton, Tennessee in Mason Hall. I mean in City Hall. Okay. They dish it out but whenever it comes to surrendering and throwing up their hands and saying we was at fault here. We shouldn't have done what we've done to this person. You probably would rather they would probably rather see their whole community perish, come to naught, than to plead out on a guilty plea that instead of the individual that's talking to you right now towards being the monster, it was actually them that was being the monster. It was actually them that was that was uh, provoking my brother and I again and again and again and just so happens we were strong enough and smart enough to resist their temptations. Oh, they was wanting 
us to get in the road and just fight like a bunch of alley cats. And don't think that it didn't cross my mind because it did. But it also crossed my mind pertaining to the teachings of Christ to be wise as serpents but harmless as doves. And I knew that if I got out in that road and I fought like an alley cat, that the, that the media, the newspaper agencies throughout this area would have caught on to that and my God, there ain't no telling what that they would have turned it into. Just like what they turned it into out in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, just like what they turned it into up here in Paducah, Kentucky, pertaining to Land Between the Lakes and also Katie's, Kentucky. Um, these are all active pursuits in wanting to draw down godly people because this is the only way that they can justify their actions by getting people to admit to crimes that they never committed. It's demonic. It's perverted. It's evil. They don't give a damn about most people's lives. Oh yeah, there are certain people in this county that I'm sure Judge Tommy Moore and Mike Wilson and Tommy Thomas, there are certain people in this district that he would probably be willing to bleed and die for tomorrow. But there's other people in this county that they would actually throw gasoline on if they seen them out in the road burning rather than trying to put them out. And they would be jumping up and down, gleaming for glory that this individual has now finally got out of their hair. Once more, they see people like me as being a nuisance, just like somebody swatting at a fly. You keep swatting at the fly. You keep thinking, well, I got him this time. I know I had to knock him against that wall. And I'll be darned five, six, ten minutes, fifteen minutes later. Here comes back that same fly. And he's pestering that person again. That's how they see us. That's how the system that is broken, the corrupt of the corrupt, the perverted, the sickos, the real sickos, are those that's walking around with, with these type of positions that's been in power now for years and years and years. Those truly are the monsters. Just like the monsters that entice the Davidians towards allowing for them to buy a bunch of assault rifles, military style assault rifles, and then turn around and bust them for selling them the very guns that they sold them to. Those are the monsters. Yes, we will see the extent to which uh, he does support this when it uh, comes to actually taking a vote. But NBC's Ali Rafa, thank you for that. Uh, Yamish, one more question for you before we let you go. That being activists, those people who've been in these marches, these rallies across the country, most notably yesterday, it's almost as if their efforts put something of a punctuation point at the end of the negotiations, right? Obviously, this was being negotiated before these rallies yesterday. But how much do you think the public outcry leading up to yesterday's demonstrations influenced senators? They were like, we cannot continue putting our head in the sand. Look at what's happening across this country. Well, Alex, I can tell you that in talking to Republicans and Democratic lawmakers, um, there was really a sense among, the, among both parties that it would be embarrassing to have Americans begging for lawmakers to save their lives, begging for lawmakers to do something to prevent gun violence in this country and for them to be able to not do anything. Um, so I get a sense that there was this feeling, not only with, of course, the big rally yesterday, but also, of course, as you said, these negotiations have been going on. You had, well, you had survivors of gun violence coming to the Senate, coming to the Congress um, and the House saying something has to be done. Um, I can think of no one that might have had more impact than the 11 year old who survived that, that terrible shooting in Uvalde, Texas, who came before lawmakers at 11 years old to say, I had to smear blood on my body and play dead in order to survive. So my sense is that lawmakers really are responding to what is, I think, a nationwide outcry to do something to change the way that people access guns in this country. Because as 
has, as you reported on the show so smartly, this is a uniquely American problem. Other countries have mental health issues. Other countries have other issues, just like America. But it is in America that we see gun violence hit numbers that are just completely exponentially worse than other countries. Mm -hmm. I should also note that David Hogg, um, who is the co-founder of March for Lives, I said this earlier, he was that group that organized over 450 events on total over this weekend, including that 40,000 plus rally, people rally in, in D.C. He came out and said he is liking what he's seeing, that this is a step in the right direction, even though he's not getting everything that he wants. You see that sign? There was another sign that caught my eye a while ago. Am I next? You may be asking, well, Juby, how come I don't see you in none of these marches? How come I don't see you load up and go to Washington, D.C. and walk around with a nice, pretty sign, handwritten sign, saying whatever? How come I don't see you do that? I am doing that. I'm doing that right now by making the video that I'm making, hoping and praying that through social media, my story, my influence, my perception, my point of view, um, the facts, I'm hoping that one day these things will make a difference. Just like that person is holding that sign right there, he or she's hoping that that, that sign that they made up will make a difference. Just like the person holding the sign up that said, am I next? They're hoping that they'll make a difference. It has reached the level in my life because of all the resistance with all the church movement here in Western Tennessee and basically America in general, that if I was gonna walk around with any sign, I would be walking around saying, I hope I am next. I hope I am next. That way I can get out of this misery. I can get out of the jungle. I can get out of this this atmosphere that evil and corrupt people and the demonic world has has created. It will put my mind and my life at ease. I will no longer have to function in the same worn out, torn up body that I've been living in now for 61 years. And hopefully I can go on and be elevated to another level to hear my Heavenly Father say, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. And then I can start doing things on a much grander level. But see, they don't want to do that to me. They don't want to put me away that way because they want me to suffer. They want me to go through this slow, antagonizing death, knowing that the injuries that I've had in the past is just going to make the pain more relentless that's what my enemies want me to go through okay but at the same time I can justify that just like me saying what I say that because of what that they have done I don't wish this upon on the lives of, of the innocent but because they have done what they have done I pray to God that they'll be one of the first ones to either take the mark 666 or their sons or their daughters or their nephews or their nieces or their aunts or their uncles will take that mark 666. Because if if the punishment can't come directly to them in this lifetime pertaining to true justice, it will eventually get to their family tree somehow or another. Oh yeah. The Bible's going to fulfill itself regardless whether one person likes it or dislikes it, or regardless whether a whole group of people is opposed to it. The Bible is going to take place the way that the Bible has predicted for it to take place. For Jesus said that all the gates of hell could not prevail against the kingdom of God. And all these people have done around here in resisting towards supporting the founder of the Windmill Ministries missions, they have only... They have only lengthened this. They have spread it out to the point that now there's widespread suffering. Okay. They have caused a hindrance in not seeing a revival and peace in utopia. 
as far as a revolution. And because of it, now it's come home to them to the point that now their own daughters or their wives have cheated on them or, or, or their daughters have been impregnated by, by a rootless, uh, drug-infested, brain-dead human being that now you got a onslaught of a cesspool that has now come back to not only the guilty pertaining to the politicians and the preachers and the deacons and the church members, but now it's come back to everybody, even those that didn't have nothing to do with this. But yet now, the innocent, the weak, those that are trying to live a righteous lifestyle, a godly, righteous, holy lifestyle, aren't smart enough to pull together in attacking the people that has created this. It's much easier for them to uh, dismiss their own accountability and, and blame it on somebody else. Just like Adam blamed it on Eve, Eve blamed it on the devil. Nobody actually stood in account in the day of, of uh, Adam and Eve towards being accountable for their own actions. God made sure that Adam and Eve, and yes, even the snake, that allowed for the devil to enter into, God made sure that all three held true to their accountability issues towards being punished for it. And if we don't watch, if we as a society, as a civilized society, cannot stop these events from occurring, then there will be somebody that will stop us in general and we will cease to exist as a society upon this planet. In other words, whenever God puts his foot down, it'll be over. It'll be over. You think that we're in tribulation right yet? You think that we've been cast off into a sick society? Give it a few more weeks. Give it a few more months. Give it to this fall and see where all this is heading. We're on a runaway train right now. We're on a runaway train heading for the path of doom and gloom. So that tells you that the people have been in this, um, that they are seeing this and saying this is a good framework, this is a good way forward. Also the Brady campaign, um, they have been in this and working on this for decades. They also came out with a statement saying that they support this framework. So a lot of, of good the words for what's going on in the Congress today. We know that that is not always the case in so many other in so many other times. In so many other times we've seen in this country where lawmakers have done nothing. Yeah, absolutely, Yamish. And you mentioned David Hogg, and I'm glad to say that he's going to be with us in our next hour. So we'll get his reaction. I'm sure he's going to echo a lot of the sentiments that you just expressed on his behalf. But having said that, with regard to the president, Yamish, and um, the pacing with which he would like to see this legislation run its way through Congress and get to his desk to be signed, how much pressure can he put on Congress to get this done? There is no time like the present when you're considering that if even one life can be saved uh, to not end disastrously as a result of gun violence, it's worth it to get this thing done. It's a critical question, Alex. Um, when I talk to White House sources, they tell me that the president um, understands that he is no longer a senator, but that he really wants to make sure that it's very clear to lawmakers that this is something that is a top priority for him. We heard the president um, in a prime time address go to the nation and, of course, to lawmakers to say this needs to be done. So there is a sense that the president is trying to pressure and make sure um, in his statement even today that this is going to be done sooner rather than later. The other thing is, of course, the politics of this. And I've talked to some Democrats about this. The president, um, his polling numbers have been lower than, than expected, lower than he wants them to be. And as a result, there are Democrats who are, are really in some ways cautious about how much they want the president to be involved. But you also see in this release that there are already 10 Republican senators and 10, 10 Democratic senators who are saying that they want this to happen. So, of course, as the details get knocked out, this could all change. But right now, you have enough senators saying, yes, we want this to pass to get it through the Senate. Whether or not that's actually going to happen and how quickly that's going to happen.
happens is the big question. Congress is notorious for one, doing nothing, and it's even more notorious for moving very slowly. But because, again, we've seen this urgency from Americans really saying we need to do something, I think the feeling is that among the sources that I've been talking to just today, that they don't want to lose the momentum that led this yeah. to get here, that led lawmakers to be able to put their, their names on a press release saying that they can come up with a solution for gun violence in this country. Momentum is key here, I think. Absolutely. Let's get this done now. Yamiche Alcindor, Ali Rafa, they're on Capitol Hill. Ladies, thank you both so much. We have more breaking news to get to right now on the arrest of 31 people linked to a white nationalist group in Idaho. They were booked on suspicion of conspiracy to riot at a Pride event that was scheduled yesterday. Police say they acted on a tip from a concerned 911 caller. NBC's Maggie Vespa has the details. Police in this small Idaho town were already on high alert after seeing chatter on social media that extremists may have been planning on converging on their community's LGBTQ Pride Festival. Cut to Saturday and a 911 call confirming those threats may very well have been real. Pulled from a U-Haul by Idaho police with masks on their faces and slogans like Reclaim America on their shirts. These guys stopped a U-Haul full of dudes. Up. Authorities say 31 suspected white supremacists were lined up, zip-tied, and charged Saturday with conspiracy to riot. Police in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, pulling the group over blocks from a gay pride festival. This after a citizen saw how they were dressed and called 911. They had shields, shield guards, um, and other riot gear with them, including a, at least one smoker. Name. They came to riot downtown. The police chief noting the group appears to be members of Patriot Front, dubbed a white nationalist hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center. Local authorities working with the FBI saying this crowd came from nearly a dozen states, including Texas, Illinois, and Virginia. This as a mid-Pride month, festivals play out across the country. Potential violence at one, thankfully thwarted. Our I'm going to back up here just a little bit just by seeing what you're seeing. Potential. Because it's really, it's, it's, what would be the right word? It's good intentions with unintended consequences towards what they was trying to pull over towards causing this type of raid or disturbance with a group of people that was doing what they was doing. I don't agree with people that's homosexuals or lesbians because the Bible don't agree with it. I feel like the Bible pertaining to the King James Version or those related around the King James Version is the right way to go. And because the teachings teach the general public that those type of activities are basically uh, an abomination in the eyes of God, in the eyes of a holy, righteous God. I try to abide by that criteria in regards towards living out that life that I feel like is required for all true born-again Christians to live. Does that mean that I never make a boo-boo and, I, and I'm, I'm foolproof and I never make a mistake? No, that ain't what I said. That's not what I said and that's not what I meant. But at the same time, even though I'm against homosexuals and, and lesbians pertaining to their alternative lifestyles, I don't believe moving in there with violent intentions is the right tactic to use with this situation. That's where we have to solely depend upon the Holy Spirit to convict these people that are living these lifestyles because of our laws and allow for conviction to fall up into their hearts and allow for maybe people to pressure them in hopefully a good way and maybe that they would be willing to convert over to the way of being heterosexual towards versus being the way that they are. You can't bring this upon the people in a violent way. 
because violence this way is only going to create more violence. That one thankfully toward it. All right, Maggie Vespa reporting there. Well, I want to bring in right now Christopher Goldsmith, retired U.S. Army sergeant and Iraq war, war veteran, also CEO of Sparvarius that is specializing in detecting extremism and disinformation. And to that end, he once infiltrated the Patriot Front group that we are talking about on this very day. Chris, thank you. Uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center says this is a white nationalist group, and you got to know some of these members. So who are they? Where do they live? What are they like? They live all over the country, and I think it's important that we don't identify them the way that they identify themselves in public. We should identify them the way that they identify uh, themselves to each other, and that's as nationalist socialist Nazis. That's frightening. National socialists, I'm writing down some notes here, uh, Nazis. You are the Aryan brothers, are the Proud Boys, are other um, extreme known groups out there that once more have good intentions but because of their bad methods it creates unintended consequences and sadly to say usually this is what the consequences will be especially once law enforcement is tipped off on a group of people that is going to uh, promote this type of violence in a gathering like this, 99.9% .9 of the time, the people that are going to suffer the consequences is going to be the very people that are radicalized towards wanting to do this. We can look forward to more and more and more of this happening here in America because of various things as that has occurred in the past two and a half or three years that has led us down this road of people all of a sudden coming out to the playing field. Let's say if you had a, a, an auditorium of 40,000 people, and all of a sudden 40,000 people decided that they was going to come out onto the playing field because they have suddenly awoken in understanding that our political system as we know it has led us down a road of doom and gloom that has been intensified by COVID and by the events that's now presently going on with Russia and the Ukrainians. In other words, it surfaced and it surfaced quick. I knew it was going to surface. I just didn't know it was going to surface this quick. I had already projected and predicted of not only the grid system here in America of various circumstances towards electrical disturbances, but I had already done, looked at this, analyzed it several different ways and in 2005, there was an advisory that went out to the United States government that was ignored. It was ignored, and because it was ignored, there has been endless amount of life that has been wasted, wasted, on the fact that these individuals that was warned, given this advisory, did not pay close enough attention a matter of fact, not only did they not pay close enough attention, they tried to turn it around like I was going to create a bloody road ahead. Or like I was going to create electrical disturbances, which just tops it off towards what type of what type of ill will society that we live in here in America. They come from all over the country, um, but who are they identifying that way? But what kind of jobs do they hold? I mean, surely they have to do something to support this because this is not a, to support their livelihood. I mean, this is not a money-making venture, right? Yeah, so there's a few members who live together in Haslip, Texas with the founder, Thomas Rousseau, who was uh, arrested yesterday. None of them have real jobs. Their jobs are basically promoting this Nazi organization. But the rest of the members, they're uh, the highest I think they've reached is around 200 around the country. They're everything from engineers to um, to waiters. And hmm. these these folks who were arrested yesterday uh, include people who have established histories of committing hate crimes. They document them themselves, uh, and all of this is available online. Hmm. How many of them are there? 
So there were 31 arrested yesterday. A bunch of those names were new to me. They're going into uh, into my database. The most that we know of uh, is they've reached about 220. Part of the problem with this organization is every time they get too big for their britches, they go out and get uh, either arrested like this or they face uh, some anti-fascist activists who teach them a lesson. Uh, and then they have a bunch of people quit and drop off. What do you mean by teach them a lesson? I mean, I'm going to interpret it to what I think, but what do you mean? <laughs> so in December, they did a march through D.C., and they had another infiltrator, who I don't know, uh, who had identified their vehicle exchange point. Right now, there's a parking lot full of cars belonging to Patriot Front members. That's where they got into the U-Haul. That's They take the U-Haul, they go to the Pride Parade or wherever they're going to get out and uh, you know try to commit violence, and then they get back in the U-Haul and go to those things. So in Virginia, uh, there were a bunch of anti-fascist activists who redecorated those cars. What was your experience like when you infiltrated this group? I mean, did you ever have any fear, not only for what they were doing, but what could happen to you were you to be discovered? So I, uh, I worked with a partner. I had a buddy of mine who I served with in Iraq who uh, joined in person. I was running basically the digital side. Uh, so I had full access to their Rocket Chat, which is basically an open source version of Slack. It's what they use to communicate with one another. They share their plans uh, for you know, getting in fights, for destroying property. Uh, committing hate crimes, that type of thing. So I got to see for, for over the course of a few months uh, exactly how they operate and how much of a serious threat that they are. What what people need to realize is we can't use the terms that they uh, use to describe themselves, right? The Unite the Right rally was not an alt-right rally. It was a neo-Nazi rally. They trick us into describing them as themselves as white nationalists. They're not white nationalists. They're Nazis. They believe that Jews, people of color, the LGBT community should be rounded up and killed. I, I, they believe in genocide. These people need to be stopped. And the FBI... And I'm going to say they probably do it in the name of the Bible, a righteous, holy God, in saying in their belief that according to the Bible... I don't know how that they could justify a person that's not of the same color, but pertaining to these people's lifestyles, they probably try to justify themselves some way or another by using this type of violence. But once more, who's the monsters here? Do we not have the blind leading the blind? Which is worse, in participating in immoral sexual behavior? are going to be like this bunch and going to create anarchy and go and bang up a bunch of heads and possibly get a bunch of innocent people killed or are or, or harmed. And as far as the deal with blacks, as far as I'm concerned, that's just prejudice or hell that I, I don't know that America will ever get fully over. And it's really sad because so many people, you know, they, they live by this concept out of sight, out of mind. And they think that, you know, we shouldn't change things, that we should live according to our customs and, and, and our ancestors. They was willing to die for this purpose. We should be willing to die for this purpose. They've been misled. They've been guided down a road of dishonesty. And to think that these people are so gullible that they would be willing to stand in line, I'm pretty sure being in that rider truck, it was probably miserable for the, for an hour, however long it took that rider truck to leave from point A to point B because they don't have no air conditioner in those rider trucks that I know of, unless they have some sort of a portable unit in there. I just imagine they was probably sweating. It was pro their, their nerves was high. Their emotions was high. I just imagine whenever they opened up that that door, it was like a fresh air breeze come in and hit them because they was probably all in there breathing the same air and probably at the point of almost passing out. But that's what people like this is willing to do in radicalizing their movement. What's more, doesn't the Bible contradict this type of 
behavior? Doesn't the Bible say to be wise as serpents but harmless as doves? There's no doubt. I can see where this is going pertaining to the lack of safety and the lack of participants with our government officials towards the people having an uprising in taking back over their government of it not being run the way that it's being run right now because various people don't think that it's being run appropriately because they see it being run to the ground. In the meantime, you still have all these people that has made all their money in the past 30 plus years that I personally have sat back and watched. I've watched them go from being this to being that. I've watched them grow. I've watched them become more powerful in the community. I've watched them become more powerful in their finances. They've went from driving this combine to where now they're driving this combine. They went from a $45,000 combine to now a three quarter of a million dollar combine. They've gone from this tractor to this tractor, okay? They went from this old beat up truck to this beat up truck. Now you, you may be saying, well don't you believe in prosperity or are you jealous because these people have, have, have uh, chosen the right type of business to the point that they have become prosperous? I'm not against nobody becoming prosperous. That's not the point that I'm trying to make here. The point that I'm trying to make is this. While people like me got shoved down the drain, while people like myself was put on a pedestal towards trying to look like that I was a monster or that I was the bad guy, it was the rich and the powerful and the smart and, and, and the experts that was growing in intensity for the past 30 plus years while I and many more have sat back and watched getting more powerful and powerful and more wicked and more corrupt. This is what has led us to where we are now. What happened in Ronald Reagan's administration is what is going on today in America. And if we're not smart enough to address it professionally and unitedly, it's, we're going to see more and more pockets like this that is going to pop up. We're going to see more and more gun violence. We're going to see more and more problems that are only going to be part of the problem rather than being the solution to the problem. It's sad. We're now living in a very, very sad state of what we're actually seeing. And I think it started in, what was it? Uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, during the time that uh, our prior president was president, and now we're seeing what we're seeing now. It's like a cancer. It's growing. And to my knowledge, has not pressed charges. This right now, this conspiracy to riot is state-level charges. It's going to be a $300 fine for each one of these guys, and they get to go home. The feds, because these people uh, traveled from interstate uh, or across a bunch of state lines. They plan this uh, over the internet. There's a, a ton of paper, uh, paper crimes that they can be charged with. And though they are minor, the FBI can move forward with this. Uh, they have, you know, all of, all of this stuff uh, is, is out in the open. I gotta tell you, Christopher, I hope the FBI is listening to this interview because I think they ought to be getting in touch with you to talk about what you know, again, as CEO of Sparvarius. Thank you very much, very sobering chat with you, but I appreciate it. Now, after Ivanka Trump said in that January 6th testimony that she believes Bill Barr over her father, how do you think her dear old dad is really taking it? Well, I'm gonna ask his niece, Mary Trump, about that next. Let's watch this real quick and then we gotta go. For, uh, con for time conscientious sake, let's speed this up and back up. Affected my perspective. Um, I respect Attorney General Barr. Um, so I accepted what he said was saying. There you heard it. One of the most notable revelations from the first January 6th committee hearing, Ivanka Trump telling the committee she believed Bill Barr that the 2020 election wasn't stolen. But her testimony likely didn't come as a surprise to my next guest, who in fact predicted that she would cooperate right here on my show back in January. She knows that 
she has to come down on the right side of things or she'll continue to you know stay her father's ally and then she'll have to see how that plays out but she's in a very bad situation because she must understand that if donald feels it's necessary he will stop protecting her well, joining me now is mary trump author of the reckoning and host of the podcast the mary trump show Good to see you, my friend. I'm going right back to what you said there. If Donald feels it's necessary, he will stop protecting her. Well, he has come out full force since the testimony, uh, since all that was revealed. He wrote this on Truth Social. I'm sure you've read it, but it wrote, goes, Ivanka Trump was not involved in looking at or studying election results. She had long since checked out and was, in my opinion, only trying to be respectful to Bill Barr and his position as attorney general. And then, of course, in this very Trumpian way, had to say he sucked. And by the way, Trumpian doesn't apply to you. That said, is this exactly what you would expect from your uncle? It's exactly what I expected from both of them. I think Ivanka walked a very fine line. She didn't say anything necessarily incendiary, but you know, as, as we uh, thought would happen, she decided she needed to come down on the side of uh, what the facts support, which is, of course, that the election was not stolen. And also, as we knew would happen, Donald didn't entirely throw her under the bus, but I just think it's really important to point out that the fact that he said she checked out, although that's kind of rude, isn't really the issue. He's accusing her of perjury, really. That's interesting. See, whenever the ship goes to sinking, the rats start jumping over the, over the ship. The dirty, stinking, low life, no good for nothing rats that are only there to survive for survival purposes. Once they realize that the sink that the that the sinking ship is fixing to sink, watch them scatter. Watch them run. That's what's happening right now. That's what my people here in Northwest Tennessee wanted me to do pertaining to this message, pertaining to this anointing that was placed upon in my life towards me issuing out this message pertaining to the end time events, the four horsemen, the two witnesses, the book of the last two chapters of Daniel, as well as the salvation plan of Christ. They wanted me to abandon this, uh, this mission. And because I haven't abandoned it, they tried to finish me off. And they was unsuccessful in their attempts because I'm still living, still breathing, I'm still alive, and I'm still being able to make videos like I'm making right now. And once more, this is my way of holding up my side by saying, this is my opinion, this is what I believe, this is how that I believe that things is unfolded. And, and regardless whether somebody believes me or not, um, it's kind of irrelevant at this point in time because it's very obvious that people are so scatterbrained. They don't know who to believe. They don't know who to trust. And because of what that, uh, that has went on, we are that sinking ship. And you will see more rats that are trying to get off the sinking ship before it actually sinks. Thank you for listening. Good luck to all of us. God bless America. God bless our troops. God bless our endeavors towards where we go from here. And shalom.